I think things have gotten really challenging for people entering the industry. So if you've come out of an accounting degree, what they're teaching in the programs right now is, is still very much the same as what they were doing, you know, 10, 20 years ago. They're, they're, they're barely scratching the surface of what has changed in the industry. And we're really expecting graduates to come out and because of the automation, the tools that we have to really step into more of like a controller role right away, which they don't have the experience for, they're really the, the full understanding to do. And so I think that a lot of uh, accounting firm owners are, are kind of struggling with, you know, how to hire the right people and, and how to really train them because I think there's a lot more onus on the business owners to to really fill the gaps in training um, for graduates. And they also have these understanding that the younger generations coming out of university are going to be more tech savvy than we are. Um, and that isn't necessarily always the case. So there's a lot of training that needs to happen when people come into the industry to get a sense of, you know, how we do things and learning all the tools and uh, making sure that they're set up for, for success. You're listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with your host, Michael Palmer. Listen each week as inspiring guests share their secrets of success to help you increase your confidence, work smarter, and build a business you love. This episode of The Successful Bookkeeper is brought to you by purebookkeeping.com, the proven system to grow your bookkeeping business. Welcome back to the Successful Bookkeeper Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Palmer, and today's show is going to be a great one. Our guest is the CEO of Entreflow Consulting Group, which is a licensed CPA accounting firm, recruitment agency, and growth marketing strategy practice. Helena Patience, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me today. It's great to have you. And I'm excited about having a conversation about your your business, but as well, your career journey. And we, we had a great conversation at the Institute of Professional Bookkeepers of Canada conference a little while back, and I'm looking forward to continuing that today. Perfect. So before we get into all of it, Helena, tell us a little bit about you, uh, your career journey leading up to this point. Okay. Bit of an unusual accountant and that's my first uh, career was actually as a theater professional. So I did my undergraduate degree in theater production and English literature. So I was a lighting designer, a director, a stage manager, and then did an education degree and went off to Europe and India to teach. Kind of fell into finance later on in life and loved it. And then when I moved back to Canada, I decided to um, pursue my CMA designation after working as an analyst in HR and as a financial analyst for years. Wow. What a, <laughs> a I mean, a, such an interesting career path, right? Doing theater. How, how has that showed up in your career today? Oh, it's great. I mean, y- you want to talk uh, deadlines. Uh, there's no deadline more strict than the curtain going up at 8 p.m. on opening night. No extensions, no delays. So I really learned the the value of strict deadlines. Also, I learned how to collaborate really well with lots of different types of people with uh, conflicting needs, it's very artistic groups. So, you know, a lot of creativity. So it's, it's actually given me a, a whole um, whack of really good skill sets that I've been able to use in my day-to-day life now. Beautiful. And so tell us a little bit about Entreflow. For sure. So my husband, uh, Ian Rogers, actually started the business uh, eight years ago now as a marketing consulting firm. And it was actually kind of an accidental business. He had started his first startup, which was um, a mobile automotive shop. Uh, so they basically had these vehicles, that, these trucks that would go to the customer to, to uh, fix their vehicles. So he started that as a, a project that actually they started during, he started during his MBA at Cornell and Queens, thought him, him and his partner decided to give it a go. And he started Entreflow just as a means to, you know, make some more money on the side while they were building their, uh, their business. So it wasn't really intended to be this going on for so long and to expand into this iteration that it has grown into. Um, I joined about four years ago and wanted to do financial consulting, uh, management consulting and uh, HR consulting. So um, joined four years ago to head up the finance and HR side of the business. And it's just grown from there. 
Wow. So interesting. You're, you both have interesting backgrounds and the mm-hmm. mobile mechanic shop was really intending to just, uh, you know, that was the end game. Did it, yeah. did it go anywhere? Did he do anything with it? He did. Yeah. He had a successful exit. So he sold it to a competitor who was based in Alberta looking to expand across the country. So it was a really good exit for him. Incredible. Well, yeah. a, a, a true entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so now you, you combine forces, you're, you're offering, I was reading your website, you have this boutique approach, which it makes a lot of sense now. You have uh, your husband who, who comes with a certain mindset, uh, and then you come with the financial end of things. How has that mm-hmm. gone and what's that been like? Yeah, it's going really well. People can, can often get confused when they see our website or, or meet us for the first time because it's just kind of unusual. You don't have a lot of firms that are doing this, especially not CPA firms. But it, when we talk to people about what we do and how it works, people love it because it's, it, it, it's really like we are your, the extension of your business and can help you in a number of different areas that really are quite interconnected when you think of it from a, a big, bigger business perspective. So the, our clients get a lot of value out of having um, a solid team of people to help them who are all experts in their own right in those specific areas. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. And so what is you know a customer that typically finds you? Or is it coming more from the financial side of things or from the marketing side? Or is it a mixed bag? It's a bit of a mixed bag. I've got a really good marketing team. <laughs> so so we've got a lot of people that come to us that are just looking for, hey, you know, I need to get my books closed, but I also want, you know, somebody to help me out with growing my business. So for them, they, they might think they're just looking for some financial support. But then when we talk to them about, oh yeah, well, we've got, you know, some growth hacking marketing gurus here that can assist you as well, then can do some extra work with them to help them, you know, with their marketing strategy and execution. We do also have people that find us because we're a licensed recruitment agency. And so they might be looking to find a company that can support them with high growth recruitment. So a lot of hires, our structure is a little bit different from a typical um, recruitment agency who charges a, you know, typically charge a percentage of annual salary. So our model is a little bit more catered to startups and, you know, lots of hires within a short period of time. So people find us for all three things. I say probably more finance and then marketing and then HR in that order. Fantastic. Now, what have been some learnings along the way? Oh, there's been a lot. (laughs) So when I joined the business, you know, it wasn't intending on starting up a public practice firm that did tax and bookkeeping and software implementation and all that sort of fun stuff. I really just wanted to work as a, you know, uh, as an independent, but quickly realized, well, looking at uh, my client's books that the bookkeeping was terrible and I really couldn't do much from a consulting perspective if the books weren't closed or the data was terrible. So uh, we initially hired uh, contractors, bookkeepers, and contractor CPAs who had you know, their own CPA firms that were looking to um, fill some capacity or what have you. And that was really tricky because it was really hard to control the quality. And as you can imagine, with most CPAs, you get to tax season and they're MIA dealing with their own clients. And so it was really hard to keep the consistency on the timing as well. So uh, we ended up hiring employees and that's worked out really well for us. And then as well, we're a fairly forward thinking firm. So a lot of people are now talking about, you know, going 100% remote or what have you. We actually started off 100% remote and then have kind of pulled it back. And now we're we're semi-remote because the, the work that we do is um, we tend to attract a lot of really complicated uh, companies with, you know, more technically challenging accounting files or, they, you know, they need a lot more um, um, high le- higher level support. And so that's a little bit trickier to mentor employees and uh, and really provide that awesome support if we don't really see each other that often. So we've actually kind of swung the other way and we're, we're semi-remote now. And then there's been lots of learning in the tech department, you know, just testing out new apps, implementing apps, throwing them out the window, starting a new one, you know, playing around with other technology to help us internally with our processes and then also with our clients just to make sure that we're, you know, super efficient so we can spend as much time as possible on delivering that high value advisory that we love to do. Fantastic. Some interesting learnings from a, from a virtual standpoint. I think you went from 
virtual, but then, you know, there is complexity and there is, mm-hmm. there is that need sometimes to get together and to, to be a team. Do you have an office space? Do you do shared office? How does mm-hmm. that work? Yeah, we have an office within a co-working space. So it's been, it's worked out really well for us because the, the co-working space has a great community. So, you know, we all, we get a lot of referrals from the community. We have a lot of people we can reach out to for, you know, if we need some, some other professionals to bring in on, you know, come some complex situations with certain clients uh, or connections as well for our clients. It's got, uh, you know, great meeting spaces. It's a beautiful space. And so it allows us to be really flexible because, I mean, quite frankly, the commercial real estate is, is hard to get come by and very expensive in Vancouver. And I don't know how big we're going to be three years from now. So not super excited about getting locked into a leash. So this has just always worked really well for us. It's uh, got a nice community and we've got the space that we need to, to do what we need to do. That's very cool. Mm-hmm. And you're also, you have a family. Uh, mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about managing a business that has 11 staff members and also uh, managing a life with family. Mm-hmm. I have to say my our, our most valued employee <laughs> is our nanny <laughs> because she really keeps everything tip top so that we can we can operate a business successfully with two children. So we have uh, uh, Oliver, who's five years old, is our oldest son, and we've got uh, Roland, who's three years old, who's our youngest son. Uh, so I have two boys. They're very energetic. So there's a lot of busyness in our in our household. We have our office is only about uh, four blocks from our house. So it's really easy for us to, you know, pop back home or what have you if something comes up. And, uh, you know, we can still sneak away and see the kids if we needed to or wanted to engage with what they're doing in the day. So we've got a lot of structures in place to to make this successful for everyone. So you know, we've got really structured calendars and uh, a fabulous nanny who helps us to make sure that we can do this successfully. It speaks a lot about team and we're, mm-hmm. we're about a year behind you with our children. Uh, <laughs> and so I get it. And the structure that you've created, does that mirror back into your business? Maybe speak a little bit about how you structure your business and what works there. Yeah, for sure. So email is like my worst enemy. So we do everything at Entreflow to reduce email as much as possible. And we've got a lot of clients that we're working with on a regular basis, either on a monthly basis or in project work. So it's always changing. We have a very fast paced, dynamic environment. So we have a lot of structures in place to support that. So, you know, we've got a daily scrum with the team. We've got our weekly one-on-ones. We've got a team meeting every Friday where we've got a strict agenda we go through and make sure that we're keeping on top of our projects, but that we also have that time to get together and, you know, build those relationships and support each other. Very collaborative environment. So, I think without the strong sense of collaboration, this wouldn't work. If everybody relied on me to be able to have the right answer all the time, I'd be answering questions all day long. So we've built a structure within our team where, you know, through communication, either through Slack or just through meeting structures or cult- and the culture generally speaking, the team's really encouraged to reach out to each other and work through uh, maybe a new problem or a challenge that they're having or ask each other questions so that the, the team can really support each other. And it's also kind of, takes into consideration the idea of the group intelligence as opposed to one person's intelligence knowing everything. And so I think we were able to get to better solutions as well because we pulled from the whole team to solve problems. Does that kind of answer your question? It does. <laughs> it does. And I'm curious, like, did you, how did you get there? Like, that sounds really fantastic. And uh, mm. I'm sure a- anyone listening, whether if they're there or not, you know, it's like, this is how we want our businesses to run. Mm-hmm. Was it always like that? And if not, what, it, you know, what were some of some key things that you did to make it that way? For sure. I think it happened by accident because. I'm not a typical accountant. So my background was, you know, in theater and teaching all over the world and working in HR as an HR analyst, uh, working as a compensation analyst, working as a financial analyst. I'd never done full cycle bookkeeping in my entire life. (laughs) So now I'm managing bookkeepers and and eventually we started doing tax as well. And I'd never worked in a public practice firm doing tax. So I really had to rely on the team um, to, to help me out as much as me help them out. So it kind of forced us into this culture where I was, you know, I don't know, I've never done this before. What do you guys normally do? (laughs) And uh, we learned together as a team. So we, we have very different strengths and use those. When I worked at Lululemon, we did a lot of strength builder or, um, 
I think it's called Strength Builder, work where you figure out what your strengths are. And then the, the, you know, the, the, the focus with managers is really to help people to play into those strengths as much as possible. So we kind of use that methodology as, as much as we can at Entreflow as well to make sure that people are doing what they are good at, but also love to do as Very much as cool. possible. Yeah. yeah, and that that would be Marcus Buckingham's work, Focus on Your Strengths, is that correct? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay, so a, a good read for anyone that's looking to bring that to their culture and a, a really remarkable organization, Marcus Buckingham and his mm-hmm. content. And like you say, you used it heavily at uh, Lululemon, which is another six very successful company. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think that's an interesting point to make is is sometimes when you don't have the answer, it's a good thing because you uh, you rely <laughs> on others to help you find those answers when you are technical and you do have the answer. It's it's kind of like the easier road to just do it yourself, but you've mm-hmm. you've kind of like you said lucked into being able to create this culture of people answering their own questions the best that they can, which frees you up to do what you need to do mm-hmm. as a CEO. Totally. Yeah. And I think it's been the our, our secret sauce in being able to elevate our accountants to be able to do high level advisory as well. When I was at a conference this last week in London, just presenting on a session on advisory and a, a couple of the accounting firm owners there were asking, well, how I can do advisory, how do I get my team to do advisory work? And really it's a it's a kind of a mindset thing. You have to be able to help elevate them and and give them the tools and the confidence to be able to be experts too. So we've we've kind of accidentally fallen into, into that space where everyone is 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 treated like experts um, in their own right, and that uh, helps to uh, us to be able to have a stronger advisory team, as it were. Wow, and and again, that speaks to not always being the one coming up with the mm-hmm. with the answers, letting people go out and, and figure it out themselves, which may have some failings. Did you have <laughs> breakdowns? Oh, for sure. Um, we've had a lot of learnings, you know, either, you know, big disasters on the bookkeeping side where, you know, people didn't fully under, understand how to use the product and, you know, did five months of catch-up bookkeeping completely incorrectly, which we had to clean up. Um, we've had... Uh, clients, some clients that have weren't getting the level of service that they were wanted because, you know, maybe someone was still kind of learning a bit. And so there's, there's definitely, you know, things to watch out for and things that can go a little bit sideways sometimes, but it's all relationships. And so you got to make sure you got those good, strong relationships in place. And you also have to make sure that you set up the accountants or your team for success, you know, so making sure that they've got all the tools in place, making sure they've got all the support and mentorship they need, but also on the client side, making sure that you're setting them up for success too, saying, hey, we've got this awesome accountant. They're really good in these industries and especially going to be awesome because they've got experience in your industry. They're going to bring a lot of value to you and, and, and selling them as much as you're selling your business in those earlier conversations so that they they know what to expect. So if they've just spoken with me and they expect me to be there as their only point of contact, then it's not going to work if all of a sudden somebody else has stepped into the picture and is their their main point of contact. Does that make sense? It does. It does. It it has me thinking about the things that you've seen. You've been at this. You're coming at it from a different a different perspective because of your background mm-hmm. uh, in the industry. What what do you see in the industry that's working and also not working? Let's start with what what you see that's working with other businesses. Mm-hmm. Um, do you mean like in in the accounting space or yeah. in industry in general? In accounting, okay. Yeah. Um, I feel like the cloud adoption is obviously flourishing at the moment. You see a lot more people leveraging the cloud and seeing the value and and how it can really benefit our clients, which is great. I know Canada has been a little bit slower to the game and, and jumping on that bandwagon. And it's great to see that a lot more firms are adopting cloud and not just from that accounting software perspective, but really seeing all the, the other apps that are out there that can help save them time and also add more value to their clients. So that's great. I think a lot of people are starting to think more and more about advisory and, and getting out of just doing compliance work and and seeing that that is actually a really good benefit for the communities at large, not just for themselves from a financial perspective. From what's not working, I think things have gotten really challenging for people entering the industry. So if you've come out of an accounting degree, what they're teaching in the programs right now is is still very much the same as what they were doing, you know, 10, 20 years ago. They're, they're, They're barely scratching the surface of 
what has changed in the industry. And we're really expecting graduates to come out and because of the automation, the tools that we have to really step into more of like a controller role right away, which they don't have the experience for, they're really the, the full understanding to do. And so I think that a lot of uh, accounting firm owners are, are kind of struggling with, you know, how to hire the right people and, and how to really train them because I think there's a lot more onus on the business owners to to really fill the gaps in training um, for graduates. And they also have these understanding that the younger generations coming out of university are going to be more tech savvy than we are. Um, and that isn't necessarily always the case. So there's a lot of training that needs to happen when people come into the industry to get a sense of, you know, how we do things and learning all the tools and uh, making sure that they're set up for, for success. And I think one other thing that people do as well is um, maybe for some of their more uh, tenured hires, they're still expecting to pay people pretty low wages. So I find a lot of people are complaining about not being able to find the high, uh, the, the right staff. And, you know, we're, we're literally hiring unicorns at Entreflow. We have to find people who are, you know, tech forward. They're okay to do advisory work. They're happy to, you know, do client facing. They can dig into it and account and, you know, analyze what's going on in that file. You know, really good, strong technical skills and accounting. It's, it's a whole host of really um, sophisticated skill set. That's not a $20 an hour job, right? So I think a lot of people are struggling to find the right team and they have to think about and maybe reconsider their compensation plans in order to find the right people to do what they want to do to move their firm forward. I agree completely. And I think it's it's always an interesting one. Having seen people running their business where it's almost the mentality of hiring people that maybe, you know, in a repetitive job, even at a, a franchise, let's say, mm -hmm. you know, a McDonald's, right? In, in some cases, they're actually paying equivalent, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like, wait yeah. a second, this isn't right, <laughs> right? So, mm -hmm. but I think it stems back to understanding the value that's there in the marketplace. And this has been a big conversation for years, but understanding the mm -hmm. value they're delivering. And if you can't, afford to hire the people, well, then what's the problem, right? You're not charging mm -hmm. enough. You're not delivering the right service, perhaps. So some thinking there, and, and really it's a different mindset to think, well, we want to offer an incredible service and really help small businesses be successful. Well, that's worth a lot. So, yeah. you know, charge more for what you're doing, hire great people, and it, it, it's a better formula, definitely. Uh, exactly. But that, that comes with change. So it's interesting to hear you say it and, and you're actually – doing it, right? And mm -hmm. uh, I've always thought, you know, as small business owners, we we have to look at how do we help our staff be successful? And, mm -hmm. you know, in, in today's world, it's hard to get by. I mean, you talk about nannies and this and that and cost <laughs> of goods and everything else. Let's find a way to pay people really well. Like that, mm -hmm. that's, it, it's possible. And so if you take it from that perspective, you're going to end up with better people in your business that are actually going to give you what you really want, which is more freedom to focus on the areas that you love doing. Exactly. Yeah. So with, with your business now, both you and your husband are entrepreneurs, interesting backgrounds. What's next for you? I've heard a little bit or saw something about an apparel brand. Tell me more about that. <laughs> yes. Just in my free time, uh, <laughs> I started a apparel brand with uh, one of my um, colleagues that I did the CMA program with, actually. So we both have a, a background in apparel. Um, we're both moms, um, really frustrated with what's on the market for our children and decided to to start our own brand. So the intention for it is for it to be an all-ages brand. We've launched, uh, we're launching our baby capsule next month. So we've been working with a um, factory in India or doing GOTS certified clothing. So the, or GOTS clothing, uh, all the fabric, the trims, everything down to the labels um, are global organic uh, textiles certified. So closed cycle um, in the manufacturing and the supply chain so that we can track the, the fabric back to the farmer, the farm that it came from. So it's been a really exciting project. A lot of learning along the way there too. You know, it's apparently really hard to get organic cotton thread in the world. It's something I never thought I would <laughs> learn so much about, but it's been really exciting and we're really excited to, to bring the product to, to the world. It's really high quality, really soft. And it was built by moms who have very energetic, messy boys and destroy their clothes really quickly. So we're hoping these are long, 
long lasting, durable clothing that can be passed from one family to another. One um, frustration I've had with the clothing for my children is that uh, a lot of the clothing is very disposable. And with our children, we were getting clothing from different families and we'd pass our clothing um, when, it, when it got too small for our kids off to other families. And then they would come back at some point, then we'd send them out to another family. And it was just great to see that we were able to share. Um, I think our culture's kind of lost that kind of passing around and sharing kind of custom. And it was really great to see our, our stuff that we collected for our kids go around and help other families out along the way. So we're trying to build a brand that has really high quality, not for the sake of high quality, but for the sake of, you know, really being able to reuse the products as much as possible from family to family. I love it. So exciting being in that same circle right now. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, there's family who, one of my wife's friends, and for whatever reason, this really high quality stuff <laughs> coming down the pipeline. And it, <laughs> it, 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 it is like we see some of the some of the clothing and it barely makes it through. I mean, our daughter is going to be wearing a lot of our clothes from, from Matthew. And so Michaela gets some of his stuff, but some of it just, it just disintegrates. And, yep. and so there is this concept of sustainability and you see, and we're seeing it happen with, with children's clothing. So you're, you're taking a stand and making more of that great clothing. Well, I'd love to know, is it launched or can we be people buy it? Uh, when will yep, they? For sure. We've got um, some of our accessories up on our very uh, small website at the moment. So we just kind of launched the website this month. So it's all very new. And so we've got some receiving blankets and swaddling blankets on there. And for those of you who know a good swaddle. These these fabrics are fantastic for swaddling. And uh, we've got some interesting fabrics there that help with the breathability too. And we've got our full line of baby stuff dropping at the end of uh, November. So that'll be, that'll be out within a month or so. Super exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, it kind of another entrepreneurial venture, which, you know, speaks to the name of your company and and I think it's uh, so exciting to hear the outcomes of the mm-hmm. spirit of the entrepreneur. And, and in one, that's doing something that all, all along the way, right, right back to the farmer in terms of making sure that the, the quality is there and that it's sustainable. And then mm-hmm. creating a product that has a long life. We need more of that. Mm-hmm. For sure. Sure. Well, this has been great. We can uh, make sure we have the link. We'll put it in the show notes. And I, I know a lot of our listeners have children and as well grandchildren. So what a wonderful time to be uh, and gift at this time of year to to be giving something that comes from the, the heart of an entrepreneur in our community and as well is good for the environment and our, for our planet. Mm-hmm, for sure. Thank you. Well, Helenia, this has been really great. Thank you so much for, for coming on to the podcast and sharing your journey and, and what you're going through. Uh, I'll love to hear how things go with Entreflow and as well with your new uh, apparel line uh, in the future. Thank you very much. It's been great to chat with you. Beautiful. And with that, we wrap another episode of the Successful Bookkeeper Podcast to learn more about today's wonderful guest and to get access to all sorts of valuable free business building resources you can go to, thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Until next time, goodbye. You've been listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with Michael Palmer. For more information and to download the resources mentioned in this episode, please visit us at thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Thank you for listening.